Good morning, and welcome to the almond and skin health session. Most of us may have heard the expression that beauty is skin deep. Is it true? Well, we don't know the answer to that question for sure, but we do know that skin health is one of many aspects of beauty. And today, hopefully, we will be able to establish that skin health certainly is not skin deep. During today's session, our esteemed speakers will demonstrate using results from their clinical studies, that topical treatment of your skin is not the only avenue to its health. Another way to get there is through your gut. Who knew? So without further ado, let's get started with this session. Here's the agenda for today's session. To start out, some housekeeping items also, which have also been posted in the chat box for your convenience. This is a live session. You will see three different boxes on your screen, the speaker video box, the slide view box, and the speaker questions box. Please note that these boxes can be moved around and resized to your liking within the platform window. We invite you to post your questions in the question box while the session is in progress. The questions will be answered during Q&A session at the end of the main session. In case we are unable to answer all the questions before the end of the session today, please contact us at the email address provided in the chat box. With that, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Swati Kagalkar, Associate Director Nutrition Research Program at the Almond Board of California. I have a PhD in nutritional science and an extensive nutrition clinical research experience. And my primary focus at ABC is oversight of ABC contracted nutrition research, public policy analysis and synthesis, and information dissemination in support of the almond industry's global strategies. Now here's a brief introduction to our speakers in no particular order. Dr. Raja Sivamani is a native of the San Francisco Bay Area and a board certified dermatologist. His expertise centers on general dermatology, including medical, surgical, and cosmetic services. With training in bioengineering, allopathic, and Ayurvedic medicine, he takes an analytical yet personalized approach to each patient. Dr. Xiaoping Li is a professor of medicine and chief of the Division of Clinical Nutrition at the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Lee completed her MD and PhD in physiology at Beijing University. Her residency training was complete, completed at the UCLA VA Internal Medicine Program in 1996, where she also served as chief medical resident. Dr. Lee has been a faculty member at UCLA and VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System since 1997, and is a board certified physician nutrition specialist. Kimberly Hyder is a nutritionist and registered dietitian in the US and UK with more than 20 years of experience in nutrition and food public relations. At Porter Novelli, Kimberly works on behalf of Almond Board of California to coordinate nutrition communications to EU health professionals and is part of the global health team to coordinate research related outreach. Carrie Neville is a registered dietitian specializing in food and nutrition communications for influencer and consumer audiences. She loves translating the science of nutrition into the good food that people eat. Carrie manages the global and North America health professional programs for the Almond Board of California and provides nutrition communication support to other food clients. With that, I'd like to invite Carrie Neville to kick us off. Thank you, Swati. So why skin health? There has been a longstanding connection between almonds and beautiful skin for literally thousands of years. Ancient Ayurvedic texts refer to almonds as sufala, which literally translates to superior nut. Ayurvedic practices are based on the belief that your outer appearance, so for instance, skin, mirrors the quality of what's happening in your body including the foods that you eat. Fast forward 5,000 years to today, 
And the interest in the connection between food and skin health continues to be of interest and is growing. A flip through women's magazines or a Google search provides multiple mentions of foods to eat for healthy skin. And those might include avocados, dark chocolate, tofu, green tea, berries, flaxseed, and of course, almonds. Skin is an indicator of overall health status, and it's also a main driver for healthy aging. In fact, healthy aging is identified as a top food trend according to a 2019 Mintel report and ingredients that promote healthy aging are predicted to be popular. So why almonds? Let's dig a little deeper into their potential skin health benefits. Almonds contain niacin, riboflavin, and zinc, all of which contribute to the maintenance of healthy skin. They also contain copper, and that plays a role in normal skin pigmentation. And almonds are rich in unsaturated fatty acids. Almonds are also rich in vitamin E. That's a nutrient that may help protect cells from oxidative stress and potentially UV damaged skin. Now, as every dietitian will tell you, people eat foods and not nutrients. And Dr. Sivamani, who will speak shortly, noted in his first wrinkle study that people who took vitamin E supplements did not see wrinkle reduction. It may be that for almonds, the whole nutrient package and the synergistic effect of those nutrients is the vehicle that provides the skin health benefit. Rejuvenation. This refers to thinking about skin aging earlier rather than later. So not to rejuvenate, but to prejuvenate. So this rather um, to connect, to correct the skin, signs of skin's aging earlier. So you would think about this as like non-invasive beauty treatments um, that kind of make up prejuvenation. According to the American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, millennials lead the trend in prejuvenation, um, and they're really eager to stop aging before it starts. And this is also reflective in the skincare industry writ large, which has witnessed a huge shift from the demand from older consumers to a younger consumer base. Moving on, concerns about acne. Concerns about acne abound because acne is the number one skin problem in the US for treated by, um, and also for global data, up to 41% of adult women, not just teenagers, have acne periodically. A lower glycemic index of which almonds can be a part is often recommended to treat acne. Now the science behind this is that insulin and insulin growth factor may lead to the formation of acne. Insulin specifically has been shown to elicit a hormonal response that results in the increase of oil production or sebum, and this makes acne worse. Along these lines, the American Academy of Dermatology recommends to eat certain foods to improve acne and advocates a low GI diet, citing research in South Korea and the US. Uh, the, the Academy also names specific foods to eat, including vegetables, some fresh fruit, beans, and steel cut oats. Further along these lines, consumers are increasingly thinking of food as skin medicine. This idea of food as skin medicine is driven in part by celebrity dermatologists who often recommend foods to eat for healthier skin. Now the lines blur and how they recommend treatment er treatments beyond their areas of practice. For example, Dr. Nicholas Pericone, who is a well-known dermatologist, some of you may have heard of, calls himself a healthy aging expert and also sells a line of expensive nutritional supplements for clear skin. Now the medical lines kind of blur even more between skincare and dietary advice with something from WebMD called Radiance. It's a new offering from that website. It covers healthy beauty, healthy aging, and fitness with lots of skincare advice from dermatologists, including the ABCs of a healthy skin diet. And in a Mobius strip, and now that little arrow becomes clear, there's a constant feedback between healthy aging and healthy appearance. It's really hard to separate the two. For some people, healthy aging means only a healthy appearance. And for other people, how, how you look and is just one piece of the puzzle in aging gracefully. But never has there been as much interest in healthy aging as now. The CDC provides public health guidance for healthy aging. There are numerous consumer magazines devoted exclusively to the hot topic of healthy aging with titles such as Aging Well and Life Extension. And the research focus will grow in importance when medical journals such as The Lancet from the UK have introduced a new scientific journal called simply or simply called Healthy Aging to share science on the subject.
So linking food and health, skin health back together. The question is, is a skin friendly food a functional food? Well, according to Food Navigator, the category is dubbed ingestible beauty and lives within the functional food space. So a good example is collagen, um, which is a protein which is meant to improve skin, hair, and nails, and has been a dominant ingestible beauty ingredient. It can be found in snack foods, such as popcorn, hummus, protein bars, and collagen water. But this must may just be the beginning. Um, the market for ingestible beauty is expected to grow to 7.5 billion in the coming years. So whether someone wants to prejuvenate or rejuvenate or just age beautifully, um, ingestible beauty definitely has a lot of appeal. Showing a positive connection between almond consumption and younger looking skin or even blemish-free skin appeals to a broad range of consumers, no matter the age. So whether they're concerned about aging or appearance, both are equally motivating factors. All right, so let me let me just reintroduce myself here. I'm Raja Sivamani, I'm one of the dermatologists, and we've ran a couple of these studies, and I'm really excited to talk to you about this. Uh, so let me motivate the question to start with, which is why are we looking at almonds? And when it comes to almonds, one of the things about almonds is that the Ayurvedic background, you know, from 5,000 years of experience, we know that almonds are rich in, uh, with modern science, we know they're rich in things like alpha tocopherol, vitamin E, even niacin, all of these uh, subsets are considered to be potentially healthy for skin. But what's really interesting is it's been used in Ayurvedic traditions for 5,000 years to nourish the skin, uh, either from a standpoint of wrinkles or if it's to uh, use them as face masks. So whether you ingest them or use them topically. So not only do you have the traditional background, but you also have the scientific knowledge that, hey, perhaps this vitamin E that's in there, along with some of the other factors are in there, could be uh, helpful. So we put it to the test. And this was the first study that we did. It was a pilot study. And we looked at um, almond consumption and how it influenced uh, wrinkles on the face. And the way we set it up was that we had two groups. And we had a, uh, in the beginning, we had a little bit of a washout. And then we had a group that went into almonds. And then another group that uh, had a control snack that was also given to them. And the almond group got 20% of their daily energy as, uh, as their um, amount that they took, which came out to a handful of almonds in the end. And the control group was nut free, but calorie matched so that we could see if this was just an influence of ingestion or did the almonds actually have an effect. And so uh, this is the consort diagram basically showing that we randomized a total of 31 people into two separate groups. And in the end, we analyzed everybody. There were very few dropouts. Um, so it was, a, it was a good pilot study all in all. Here's a background on the demographics. So when you look at the demographics, the age uh, of the people that were in there, these were primarily post-menopausal women. And the reason that we focused on that group is because that's the group of people that are accelerating in their aging and the development of wrinkles, especially during that period of time. And not only that, we looked at people that had very sun sensitive skin. So Fitzpatrick skin types one and two, because we know that when you have a low Fitzpatrick skin type, which means that you're very sensitive to sun damage and you're at the point where the hormones are shifting with menopause, that's, an, that's a time period in life when, uh, when the wrinkles are accelerating. And you can see that there is no difference in the body mass index as well. So overall, pretty similar groups. And so I want to cut right to the results that we found. And this was over 16 weeks. And looking at the left bar, first of all, what we're reporting there is a percent change in the overall wrinkle severity. And the wrinkle severity is a mix of the depth and also the width of the wrinkles. And then um, if you just look at the overall width, width of the wrinkles, that's what we report on the right side. And what you see here is that eight weeks, you don't see much of a difference between the control group or the almond group. But as you carry the supplementation out to 16 weeks, which amounts to four months, basically, uh, you can see that there's about a 9% reduction in the wrinkles. And the way we assess this, I think, is very important. This was not clinical grading. This was high-resolution imagery where we take reproducible image shots, and then we can, what we, what, as what we call, ghost the person into the same position from shot to shot. And then the imaging system is able to uh, use shadows on the face and uh, three sets of cameras to then uh, calculate what is the wrinkle depth, the length, the width, 
So it's a very objective reproducible measure that we validated even with clinical grading. And it's actually more resolute than clinical grading because it can catch micro variances. And you can see on the right hand side, the wrinkle width also uh, had about the same amount of improvement, about 9% improvement in wrinkles at 16 weeks. Now this is interesting because 9% isn't something that you might pick up uh, clinically uh, in, in the sense of the, the standard way that we grade, but because of this imaging, we're able to pick them up, pick up changes in wrinkles earlier and see statistical differences. So this was exciting and we wanted to see were there any changes to the skin barrier. Transepidermal water loss is a measure of how quickly you lose water through the skin. And it's, uh, it signifies how good of a barrier that you have. And in this particular case, we did not see any change in the transepidermal water loss over the 16 weeks. Basically, um, what, what this uh, tells us is that the almond supplementation didn't alter the skin barrier from what the control group was taking. And then we also wanted to look at, did the sebum excretion rate, basically the rate at which you're releasing oil onto the skin, did that shift? Could that have been a reason for why the wrinkles had shifted? And no, that's not what we saw here. We didn't see any shift in the sebum production either. Sometimes you, uh, one of the concerns is if you really load people up with more calories that you might start to um, up, upregulate, as we say, the, the oil production. Um, but in this case, we didn't see that sort of a shift. And so I wanted to show you an example of how we take these reproducible photos. So they're color um, calibrated and they're taken in the same position from shot to shot. And so what we're able to do is we're able to map out all the fine lines on the sides of the eyes, on the forehead, along the cheeks. And so you can summate the entire face and track them over time from beginning to end. And then overall, there were no side effects in the study. No one uh, dropped out for reasons of any sort of GI upset or there was no issues with the, with the almond ingestion. In fact, uh, everybody tolerated it just fine. And so the overall results from the pilot study were that the wrinkles uh, were improved in the almond supplementation group and that it, there was not any change in the sebum production or in the skin barrier function. Uh, but, you know, as with all pilot studies, we find that that's exciting, but then we want to follow up with an expanded study and we wanted to take this study out for a longer duration in an expanded study population to see if what we found in the pilot study did hold up. So just to remind you of the two groups again, um, now you can see there's expanded people in these groups. This was close to almost 60 people. This was uh, a total of 56 people in the, in the follow-up study. Again, two groups where we had 20% of their daily energy coming from the almonds, a handful of almonds. And then the control group had the same nut-free calorie matched snacks so that we weren't accounting for any differences from any sort of calorie confounding. And here's what we found. So what we found was in the, the black bar is the almonds and the blue bar is the control group. So we again, looked at the relative change in wrinkles from baseline. This was wrinkle severity. And this is again, a measure of depth and width. And we find that that's a, a, a more reproducible way of tracking wrinkles because then you can account for fine lines and you can account for deeper wrinkles and you can look at shifts either in depth or in the width. And what we found was that Similar to before, at week eight, we didn't really have much of a shift. At week 16, you start to see that there is a, about a 10% difference that um, in, in the wrinkles, almost close to actually in this particular study was close to 14%. And what we found was that at week 24, it held up at about 14%. So there was about a plateau, but we saw that these results held up even up out to week 24, which amounts to about six months. And we really wanted to do an extended study just to see is this some um, eccentricity of short-term measurements or does it hold up over time? So we find that at week 24, you continue to have those benefits that we saw at week 16. And you can see here of really important note, the control group had no shift or improvement in wrinkles. So uh, as opposed to placebo effects that we see in a lot of places, we didn't see a placebo effect here, a control group effect. What we saw was no effect from the control group. Uh, this was an unexpected finding. Now in the Ayurvedic literature, we do talk about how almonds may be helpful for pigment and evening pigment on the face. And in fact, they'll use face masks for this purpose. And I know that a lot of ingestion of formulations will include almonds as part of the dietary formulation to try to even facial pigment. It's not something that we assessed before, but we wanted to assess it in this study. And uh, interestingly, what we found out now here, the blue bars are the almond supplementation and the orange bars are the control group. 
we actually found that the relative change in the pigment intense <clears throat> intensity decreased in the almond group. So you can see at week eight, there was not much change from one. And if you, when you look at one here, that means that that's the baseline measure. And as you drop from one, it means there's an, there's an improvement or a decrease in the intensity. And what you find is almost a 20% decrease in the pigment intensity at week 16. And out to week 24, you see that pigment in intensity stay decreased at 20%. Very interesting because originally we were thinking wrinkles, but what we found was that the pigment intensity also seemed to shift. It's not unexpected though, because this is something that comes from the Ayurvedic tradition, but it was definitely unexpected from a scientific study standpoint. And then when we looked at skin hydration in this particular case, now again, remember the black bars are uh, the almond supplementation, the blue bars are the control group. What we found is, and if you look at baseline and track over time, uh, we saw that there was a, a modest increase in hydration in both groups. And so it's hard to say that the almonds necessarily were contributing to the extra hydration in the skin. It could have been an environmental effect. We're not sure exactly what the uh, reason for that was because we saw it in both groups. We saw an increase in hydration uh, in, in the almond supplementation. But when you look at the control supplementation, uh, oh, so let me, let me also state that in the control supplementation, um, what we found was, again, uh, we didn't see much of, there was no shift of difference between the uh, almond and the control supplementation, basically. Okay, when we look at trans epidermal water loss and we're looking at um, the almond and the control supplementation groups, uh, we also didn't see much of a shift at all. So similar to the previous pilot study, uh, no change here. So that's not unexpected. And then finally, when we're looking at sebum exc excretion rates, and we're looking at uh, the control group and we're looking at the almond supplementation group, what we, uh, what we found and what we're listing here, what we're showing here is that um, uh, over time, we're finding that there is a shift in the control group. The control group had much higher rates of uh, sebum secretion, but we didn't see that shift in the almond supplementation group. And so what we think is going on is just adding calories may have stimulated the sebum production to go up, but it didn't happen in the almond uh, supplementation group. So overall, what we found was that almond supplementation significantly reduced the appearance of wrinkle severity, and not only to 16 weeks, but we carried that out to 24 weeks in this particular case. And the almond supplementation also significantly reduced the appearance of pigment intensity, which was interesting, unexpected, but very interesting finding. And then uh, the control supplementation increased sebum excretion rate on the forehead. We do know when you start to eat a lot of calories, um, sometimes what can happen, and we see this even in acne studies, you can increase the sebum excretion rate. However, in the almond group, even though they were taking the similar amount of calories, we didn't see this increase in sebum excretion rate. So uh, when it comes to why we're getting changes in the wrinkle severity or why we're getting changes in the pigment intensity, uh, our hypothesis at this stage is it's probably likely related to either the vitamin E that's coming in there or perhaps even the niacin that's contained within almonds. Almonds are complex foods, so there's probably several components in there which we'll have to dive in deeper and understand what's going on. But uh, clearly, it's not something from altering the biophysical properties, especially when it comes to sebum. So we do have some remaining work that we're going to be doing in this uh, second study. We're going to be looking at the gut microbiome and how that shifts from before and after to see if uh, there could be some aspect there that may be controlling how these almonds are working. And then we're gonna be looking at plasma studies as well. We're, being, we're gonna be looking at things like short chain fatty acids and whatnot, and those are pending and we should be getting those results back momentarily, in fact. Uh, we're looking forward to getting them. We were hoping late November, of course, with COVID, there's a little bit of delay in lab work and whatnot, but uh, we're um, awaiting those results uh, very soon in December. And so I'll be very excited to share those once we get them. Now, there are some future studies that we're going to be looking at as well. Now, I talked about almond ingestion, but we also want to talk about what happens when you put it on topically. And so we're going to be looking at almond oil, and this will be primarily looking at cold pressed almond oil. And we're going to assess for how does that shift wrinkles and pigmentation. So more in, uh, in, in, uh, in the waiting. So we'll, we'll have those exciting studies coming up. And then we have a study that we're planning for acne. And I want to talk a little bit about this because um, Kimberly just touched upon this a little bit earlier. 
So with acne, we know that when you take glycemic index rich foods, so things that have a high glycemic index and that can shift the glucose levels in your bloodstream, uh, for example, high sugar foods or uh, other foods that may like whey protein, things that can spike insulin, we know that that can also spike acne. On the flip side, what's interesting, and this is one study here where they uh, looked at people as they ingested white bread, and then some of them also ingested almonds, what they found was that as people ingested almonds, they could reduce the glucose spikes. And so this is kind of an exciting background to then think about, can we start using almond supplementation as a, as a way to lower these glucose spikes in people with acne? And can that help reduce how much acne that they're getting or developing over time? Not that it would prevent the causation of acne because you know a lot of folks will have acne as a background, but can, can then you help modify how their acne flares are not based on uh, their supplementation with this as a, a nice dietary addition to what they're eating. So with that, I just want to thank the group that has um, been helping me do a lot of this research. It's been a collaborative group between the dermatology department, the nutrition department, and also Sacramento State, where we have a microbiome research initiative that's underway right now. And uh, we're looking forward to more studies as we uh, go along, and we hope that uh, we'll have more data to report next year. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? All right, so it is a um, great pleasure to share with everyone about the health benefit of an almond. And you know, being a woman myself, I'm particularly interested in how we can eat better, live better, and to keep our skin um, really uh, young. And that kind of uh, it is really the reason we have done the study uh, we're going to share with you. As we all know, the times we can just point the fingers at our parents and blame them for everything is definitely over. And we know. Our genetics only play about 30% a role in overall our health. And the other 70% is a truly a result of how we live our life. It is a interaction between our genetics and with the environment. And that is a nutrition and exercise. Out of those two, nutrition plays the major role. And that is also the most modifiable uh, factors in our control, in our own hands. And here we're gonna talk about how and we can just um, do better with our food choices as a major part of um, you know, health, healthy lifestyle and see how that would impact on how our skin uh, ages and how we're gonna look. As we all have just heard from our expert dermatologist, and the photo damage, that is the damage we received from the environment, mostly UV, it is one of the key factors and impact on our skin aging. That can be judged by appearance of wrinkles and pigmentations, and also the spots we are not um, pleased to see. And on the overall, the skin tone, those are all related to um, the uh, photo aging um, from the uh, UV. And we also now know pretty well what are the things and really accelerating the aging and what are the things really actually can help us and slow down the aging process. And that is listed here in this picture here. And that's including our choices of a healthy food. And there is the environmental factors of air pollution, smoking, and how much sun exposure and we give ourselves and all of that. So now I'm going to just now advance to what we typically would think about, try to really promote the good and decrease you know, what is bad for our skin. And the conventional thinking is what, what I'm going to do with my skin. 
Are we going to do another face mask or are we going to pick up what kind of uh, our creams for our skin? And particularly we pay attention to, okay, so we have nutrients and really in the cream we're going to put on our skin. And with the kind of a hope, the direct contact will really make most of the difference. Actually, that is the only part of it. The beauty is truly from inside and out. And skin is one of our body's largest skin, and that is linked to everything else. And that from, you know, really our overall lifestyle, including the um, nutrients we have fed ourselves and by eating every meal. So that is what makes a really major part of it, uh, the influence on overall our health. Of course, that including our skin uh, as well. So the study we have done is a very small study and different from and the previous study, we actually study young women, young Asian women to start with and try to have the skin tone is as uniform as possible. And we are usually Asians having the skin tone is, um, you know, uh, Fitzpatrick uh, skin type and the three and four. And we actually study young people instead of, uh, you know, postmenopausal women. And we also, uh, you know, compare food to food. We give healthy snacks and that is almond versus pretzels. And we did that for 12 weeks. Here it is what we um, use objectively to measure um, you know how healthy uh, or how much change we have and before that this is the people we have uh, enrolled in our study uh, as i have just described to you young healthy asian women now here it is the objective measure i have just mentioned to you what we do is use a forearm that is the least sun exposed area. So to decrease the uh, variability from natural sunlight exposure. And we put on a sleeve with tiny little windows open up and then we shine UVB lights to the skin. Now look at what's a dose of UV um, you will need to really produce one of those tiny red spots from sunburn. And the higher amount of UV um, exposure you need, and the better your skin is, or and the stronger you have endogenous, uh, you know, antioxidants and or endogenous sunscreen. So that is the objective uh, measure we're using in this study. So what we have found is what I'm showing you here. And the first is on the top. And is we can compare the two group of women, and the ones that every day have almonds versus the group with pretzels. You can see, obviously, after consume almonds for 12 weeks, your skin is much resistant to the UV light. Take a higher dose. That's measured by the amount, uh, the intensity, and how long it takes. So that's the bottom uh, figure showing you. Either way is showing you, and by simply consume almond every day, you make your skin much a healthier stage and more resistant to UV light. Um, that is very encouraging. Even we actually studied just Asian women to start with. And next, I wanted just to really um, showing you, also being mentioned by Raja uh, earlier, and we look at the microbiota change as well. And this is in a study we actually done in college student and look at almond consumption on gut microbiome change. And this is the figures are showing you is that almond consumption can really help your gut become much more diverse and much more balanced with microbiome. That is the key to keep not just the skin, but our overall body in better health. And to really um, summarize what I'm, I really learned from our small study is that and almond is really a healthy uh, choice for snack. It can really help our skin as one of the organs and to become much healthier and more, much more resistant 
to the uh, UV light. And that can be, in our study, artificial measured ones and to what we expose ourselves to um, in a natural environment. So here's my take home message. And skin health is a part of our overall health. That's number one. Number two is that never too early to start take care of your body. It's important to do it when we are turning 40s, 50s, but it's much better start as early as possible, not just for the skin, but also for overall health. There's nothing as good as prevent the damage from happening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. That was really valuable information. So we wanted to take just a moment to share with you um, some of the activities we did to get the word out about findings from Dr. Sivamani's first um, wrinkle study. Um, I'd like to share some of them with you. Um, we first started back in October of last year, which feels like a lifetime ago, um, with a global synchronized launch. Um, this was with a press release and a unique mailer to really get the grab media's attention about our new research. We also conducted outreach to sort of tell the story, both to consumers and to health professionals. So let's pause for a second to explain by health professionals, we mean dietitians and nutritionists who play a really valuable role for us in hearing the science of our research and then being able to advocate almonds and sort of validate that research to consumers. Um, health professionals do an important job of um, sort of taking all the science that's out there and making sure that consumers can understand what it means to them. Um, I have a little bias because I'm a health professional myself. Um, within the US, we hosted um, media tours with the dietitian Carrie Gans, who's very well known, and a celebrity facialist named Angela Caligula um, to help tell our messages. In the UK, Italy, Germany, Fr and France, in partnership with the US team, we produced a diet and skin health webinar um, for health professional audience. This, we were lucky enough to have Dr. Sivamani present as our featured speaker. Um, to really communicate the science and the messages for consumers to understand about eating almonds and wrinkle reduction. So after we had this special educational webinar, we surveyed our health professionals to see what they thought of almonds and skin health. We asked them, after participating in this webinar, will you recommend almonds as a snack for skin health? 86% of them said yes. So it was an overwhelmingly positive response. And of course, um, not, last but not least, um, we supported this with U.S. consumer advertising through the Natural Beauty Campaign, which featured creative, uh, social, featured social creative and digital banners to share the news that, almond, that eating almonds may decrease wrinkles and drove consumers to almonds.com almonds to learn more. So these tactics together allowed for an early splash at launch, at launch and then over the last 12 months, it's been sort of a slow burn where we've been really creating the positive steady media coverage uh, that shares the information about our research and, un and help increase the understanding for health professionals about almonds and skin health. And I just wanted to take a moment to share with you some of uh, the consumer, or consumer media coverage and lifestyle media from Europe, the US, Mexico and India. Uh, this is from when we communicated about um, Dr. Sivamani's study at launch. Um, so kind of a, a lot of different uh, coverage there that all the teams are really proud of. And then if you move over to Asia, just wanted to share with you sort of the breadth of coverage um, in Asian media. Um, even if you can't read all of it, you can see the images that they're vibrant um, and helping communicate um, the study, but also really shows the appetite for skin health research in Asia. I'd like to think that we're making really nice progress in getting the word out to consumers and nutritional professionals alike. They're definitely eager and receptive to hearing more nutrition research from us. And they will soon learn more about how eating delicious, nutritious almonds impacts skin health when we're able to share Dr. Sivamani and Dr. Lee's new exciting findings that you just heard. So please stay tuned um, and thank you. And we're uh, we have it over to you, Swati. Thank you, Kim. And welcome back, everyone. Wow, that was exciting. So if we were to sum up everything we just heard today, I think it's very 
possible to say, and we know from the studies that have been done, that almond consumption is really great when it comes to helping reduce wrinkle severity, which refers to both the wrinkle length and the width of the wrinkle. In addition to that, we saw today that results show that almond consumption can actually help improve pigmentation. That's really great too. You know, for those of us who really suffer from little skin blotches, we know what that means for us. And then um, when, when we're looking at results presented by Dr. Lee, we also see that almond consumption is showing promise in the area of photo aging. So we're not saying that we should stop putting sunscreen on. By no means are we saying that, but what we're saying is that it's really good to add a step onto that and perhaps consume almonds as that additional step because as the study shows, it really does help protect us from UVB damage. So very, some very, very beneficial skin health effects of almonds. And so with that, I'd really like to transition us to the Q&A session. We've been getting some really great questions. And I'd like to start out with a question that came in from um, the chair of the board, of the Almond Board of California. His question is directed to Dr. Sivamani. And he would like to ask, Raja, hi. He would like to ask you, do the results of your follow-up study apply to other skin types other than Fitzpatrick 1 and 2? And if not, what other skin issues do other skin types encounter that almonds might be investigated for? Absolutely. So I think one of the things with this uh, expanded study was we stayed largely within the same treatment group. And so what we did was we still did recruit Fitzpatrick skin types one and two, and they were postmenopausal women because, you know, when we're doing an add-on study, we didn't want to expand the set. We wanted to really understand what was our result that we we're finding. Were they going to hold up in an expanded maybe number of people, but we didn't want to change the subset. But I think the question is a really, really astute one because it's not just that we're looking at Fitzpatrick skin type one and two. Now for wrinkles, that's definitely there. But when we see pigment as a shift, that really makes me want to start expanding future studies into other groups because when you look at Fitzpatrick skin type one and two, their major concerns are usually collagen breakdown and wrinkles. When it comes to pigment issues, that's definitely a concern, but you see that creeping up much more in Fitzpatrick skin types three, four, and five because they have more inherent melanin and pigment. So now the issue isn't so much wrinkle formation, but it's uneven pigmentation. So I think the unexpected findings really, uh, there are, I, uh, uh, there's a phrase that one of my attendings like to use, seductive reasoning. So my seductive reasoning is, oh yes, this is very exciting to think we could potentially apply this to other skin types. But I think what we'll need to do is have a follow-up study to look at that more specifically. But uh, yes, pigmentation is an issue and redness is another issue that I didn't really report on here, but that's something that we'll need to follow up on as well. But, um, but I think the pigment, is, the pigment endpoint is very interesting to expand to other skin types. Great, thank you. And I'm sure our viewers can really connect with your idea of seductive reasoning. <laughs> All right, we have another question here for you. It says, um, it's from one of our audiences He's, and they're asking, I've seen almond oil in many beauty products. Is there a correlation between the nutrients in almonds and the benefits of almond oil? Well, this is um, very interesting and I love this question because we are about to run some studies on almond oil right now. And let me just give you a little background for why I think almond oil is interesting. First of all, they're not all created equal. It depends how you get them, if they're refined, if they're cold pressed. In fact, when we're assessing different oils for what we'd want to use in our study, we found that there was a range of uh, tocopherol content in them as just you know one marker. But remember that there's also fatty acids that are in there, so they can help support the skin barrier. In fact, there have been a couple studies looking at topical almond oil uh, to reduce pressure injuries. This was uh, There were some that were published just in 2020, this year looking at pressure injuries versus just using some sort of other emollient. So perhaps there's other things in there that are helping the skin barrier. But secondly, uh, even in 2007 in mice, they did a study and, you know, I can defer to Dr. Lee on this, but 
um, they, they did a study on mice where they actually exposed them to ultraviolet light. And then they had a, another group where they had almond oil pretreatment and exposed them to ultraviolet light. And they found that the, the, the deleterious changes in the skin from ultraviolet overexposure were mitigated by a pretreating with um, almond oil. So I do think that almond oil, not only does it have the vitamin E, but we don't want to just reduce almond oil to vitamin E because there's a lot of other things in there that I think are helpful for the skin. There's also the fatty acid content. And, uh, and, I, and as I mentioned before, the niacin that's in there when you take it um, orally, actually we use topical niacin forms like niacinamide to help reduce pigment and redness. So it's uh, very interesting to see how that might play out in some of our upcoming studies. But there's definitely nutrients in there that would lend credence to say, let's create a hypothesis that looks at how this affects photoaging. So it's absolutely there. Great, thank you. And I think I completely agree with your assessment that it's really not a good idea for us to, po you know, just point at vitamin E in almonds because it's really a vehicle with good fatty acids, with vitamin E, with a lot of other great micronutrients that are probably working towards skin health. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Lee, the next question is for you. It's great to see the effect of almonds on photoaging and the improvement that it provides. The question is, do you see potential in almonds to address other issues in the Asian skin type? So some of these issues that have been highlighted could be acne or just a desire for glowing skin. And do you see potential for almonds there? Thank you uh, for that question. I actually think the answer is definitely yes. And almond has so many different nutrients in it. And as we have just uh, heard from our expert. And the other point I wanted to make is that we, we mentioned a vitamin E. Vitamin E alone versus natural vitamin E um, in almond as a whole mixture of nutrients are totally different. And the, what we have been amazed over and over again is that single compound, it is not as good as the natural compound in the natural environment. So from that alone, I would really echo and you know take almond as a natural food. And that is a better choice. Just try to single out one nutrients and just focus on that nutrients alone. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say is that um, our study clearly have demonstrated that when you take almonds, skin is only one of the organs really take advantage of it. And others, um, many, almost every single one of them, our organs can benefit as well from almonds intake. And the marker we use, the UV lights, in addition to photoaging of um, the skin. And that is also, and the same um, insult to our skin is called skin cancer. So and by taking almonds regularly, and that can really decrease your chance for that as well. That's in addition to how the skin looks like. And the other area, you know, we are, you know, both group here are gonna look into it is how it in really interacts with our microbiota. That can be in the gut, but also on the skin locally. And we used to think any food we eat is just for our human cells, for our own organ. But that's definitely not true anymore. Every single bite we take and every single almond we're taking in, and it is not just for human cells, but that's also for our microbiota as well. So in addition to think about what those nutrients do to our cells, we have to think about how, what they do to our microbiota and that in turn impact on our overall health, including our skin. That's, that's a great answer, Dr. Lee. And I agree with you about the microbiota uh, connection there. We have funded studies in that area as well, and have found that almonds do have beneficial impact on microbiota. So I think we can definitely see that connection there. I have another very good question that has come in. Uh, the question is, do we use organic almonds in our studies? I can answer that and say, uh, no, we don't. Um, but these are pasteurized almonds. 
And the question to either Dr. Sivamani or Dr. Lee is, uh, would there be a difference in results if, uh, if the almonds were organic? I can take a shot um, first um, because almond is a nut, is really um, you know, protected with the outside shell. Um, I don't think that there is an issue with pesticides and all the others. Um, so the answer is, and there have been people really trying to study the difference between um, you know, organic grow uh, food overall versus uh, you know, conventional. It is actually hard to really see major differences. I'll give you one example, which is a you know a study we have uh, done, and you know looking at a fruit, all right, um, and what's the nutrients in it, particularly looking at phenolic compounds, and many of you are very familiar. That's a major source of antioxidants. What we have found is that when the fruit uh, is really bared in a harsh environment, including you know, um, all kind of stresses can be from insects and everything else. And that's the time they actually produce more, not for the purpose of a human consumption, but for their own survival. They actually can be more, you know, like we, I just said, from not a compound point of view, a more rich uh, source of it. And when you truly, you know, sometimes protect them too much and then control the temperature, the lights, and then, um, you know, insect control, everything else, and that actually not necessarily increase all those nutrients content in the food. I think we still need to know more about organic versus conventional uh, food. Um, you know, simply just really looking at the, you know, pesticides and all those we've been using um, is actually quite limited. And I think that more study need to be done to have really good answer for that. Two. I think that was a pretty money. great answer oh. from Dr. Lee. I thought that was a that was a pretty good answer overall. Uh, I'll only add that. You know, there's more that goes into almond nutrition than simply organic versus not. You know, how you process it changes its uh, its function. Also, whether you blanch or not might change its ability to affect the microbiome. And then um, how it's ground up, if you're going to extract it, and how the oil is produced. So there's so many factors along the way that I think it'll end up being just one of the factors. So... For me personally, I think what's important is if we can get raw almonds or something that's at least pasteurized, I should say, that's it's very important so that it's safe when you're ingesting. And then the other thing is if you're going to use oils, the cold pressed oils seem to have much higher nutrient content. So those are the two that I really look for when I'm thinking about studies, but not only for studies, but for ingestion too. Our audience, I do want to say that the, the almonds we used for the studies that Dr. Sivamani and Dr. Lee conducted, they were whole natural almonds that were pasteurized. So uh, we didn't use other forms of almonds. Um, here's another question we have, and I think it's uh, directed towards you, Dr. Sivamani. It says, what is the historical use of almond oil in skin care in different cultures? So I guess that could be something Dr. Lee could answer as well. Well, in uh, Ayurvedic medicine, which is probably one of the, the, the traditions that is king or queen, whoever you want to have as your monarch at the top, uh, when you look at uh, the, the use of oils, Ayurveda is rich in the use of oils. And almond oil is one of those that is richly used. It's considered an anti-inflammatory oil in the way that it's used. Um, it's used with other herbs that are mixed in with it. You rarely will find in the traditional uses that an oil is used just on its own, although that can be done. Uh, and uh, usually there are some herbs that are mixed in there and they'll use them in a couple of ways. They'll use them for facial mas massage. There are facial massage techniques that are based in the Ayurvedic tradition that will use oils and almond oils are frequently used there. And then not only that, even for the body, just as a moisturizer, they have something called self abhyanga, which is self massage. And it's a nice way of bringing in a mind-body approach to, um, to massage and also just a mind-body approach to tuning into your own body. 
And there you take oils and massage it onto your own skin. So there's a rich tradition of using oils for skin health or just even connecting the mind to the rest of the body uh, and using oils as a conduit to get in, get in connection with yourself. So something we probably all need a little bit more of during COVID, to be honest, because we're all a bit more stressed with things too. But that's a little bit of the history from the Ayurvedic uh, standpoint. Do you have anything to add? Almond is usually uh, anti-inflammatory and to really lower the heat. Um, so that is a really one of the main purpose has been used um, for that purpose. So it's a really important uh, food to balance your yin and the yang um, because when you have too much heat and that is the inflammation infection and too much cold or too much damp, and then you are having issues with digestions and all of that. So almond, it is being long recognized one of those key, um, you know, food or herb to keep in the young well balanced. Let me yeah, let me add on to that, too, Dr. Lee, oh, because sure. I want to just I just want to say same thing in Ayurvedic medicine. There's so much overlap with traditional Chinese that it lowers heat as well. That is uh, exactly right uh, from our stand from the Ayurvedic perspective. We have the similar concept there of uh, reducing what's known as pitta, which is heat. So um, looks like these traditions probably figured something out amongst each other, huh? Absolutely, yep. absolutely. Great. Well, I hate to do this, but we're at the end of the hour, and it's been a fascinating conversation, great session. We do have other questions coming in still, but unfortunately, we don't have the time to answer them. So I would like to request our audience to send any questions we may not have gotten to to uh, the email address that was posted earlier. It is nutritionrfp at almondboard.com. So you can send your questions there if we didn't get, get to them today. Um, thank you all very much. And I'd like to especially thank our speakers and a great shout out to Carrie and Kim for getting the word out to our consumers. Thank you so much.